from humble beginning arriving in America with $70 and two suitcases, starting life in a new country, learning the language and culture, and getting any job possible to start building the dream of tomorrow and turning it into a business and life. That's yours. It's not a unique story. The struggle isn't rare for entrepreneurs trying to break into the American dream, and people are conquering their dream every day. This is Riding the Tiger podcast, turning feelings of danger, fear into confidence, control, and helping entrepreneurs be the best version of themselves. I'm your host, Nong p u n s u w a t a n a Thanks for joining me. On the third episode of Riding Tiger podcast, today I'm speaking with my friend Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Nong. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us uh, at your uh, beautiful cabin today. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Would you mind uh, uh, introduce uh, yourself uh, to uh, the audience? Please don't be shy. Sure. Uh, and let's say they don't know you before. Of course, of yes. course. Um, well, my name is uh, Jeremy Pelly, and um, currently I live in. This really idyllic uh, situation, which I feel very lucky about. Um, but before this life, before I was here, um, I was uh, a co-founder and creative director at OMF GCO, um, a creative branding studio in Portland, Oregon. Um, what's up, fellas? What's up uh, my, to my old partners and to my old crew? Um, miss you guys. Hope you're doing great. Um, And um, before that, I was a creative director, uh, an art director at Ace Hotel, um, focusing primarily on Ace Hotel Portland when I first got hired. But then I also helped open uh, Ace New York and Ace Palm Springs subsequently uh, between the years of 2006 to 2009, 10 ish. Um, and uh, before that, I really, I was honestly a skateboarder from Texas that um, was really interested in a lot of different creative expressions, uh, everything from DJing to photography to writing to videography to um, kind of you name it. Like I was really just a creative kid um, and really interested in making creative stuff with other other people. So, um, but yeah, so that was kind of a backwards narrative uh, of how where mm -hmm. where I am now. And uh, you you mentioned the first business uh, that you have mm. uh, when you were a kid. Uh, can you tell us about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, OMF Chico was my second business. Uh, not yes. a lot of people know that. Yes. Uh, my first business um, was uh, actually a skateboard shop in in Lubbock, Texas, where I'm from. Yes. Um, I I opened it in high school. Um, I had this idea. Uh, my friend and I. Um, I was in. The work study program, and I was like, you know, if you're in the work study program, you get out of school early to go work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if we own our own skate shop, then our work <laughs> is skating. And I was like, that seems yeah. like I'm cheating the system. So that was my plan, and it worked. And um, believe it or not, I I re retained a 4.0 um, grade point average. I uh, was doing great in school. Got out of school early every day. Didn't open my shop until school let out because why would I open early? Everyone's in school, um, and so I just basically skated all the time, and it was super fun. And so that first that first um, business venture gave me the confidence to do what ultimately I did with with Fritz and OMF Chico. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I learned a lot, and it was a, a really I mean I'm super grateful for that experience. I had a lot of support from my my dad in particular, but from both of my parents, and um, it it I, I recommend it. It's it's shockingly easy to start a business, so I recommend everyone try it. <laughs> so, do you think that um, you know uh, that experience uh, helping the skill of uh, uh, connect uh, your vision and make it into like a reality? Yes, exactly. Uh, you you know it, it's it's honestly a real combination of my like one's own vision plus how they think they can serve. Their community, their audience. You know, like if, if I think that the strongest products and services and entrepreneurs out there really pay attention to like who they're serving mm -hmm. and what they need, and like you know what you know. You don't just make a product that you think is cool well, exclusively because you know that's great, but mm -hmm. that only goes so far if no one needs that thing. If it doesn't serve a purpose, if it doesn't mm -hmm. solve a problem for somebody, mm -hmm. um, then it's not nearly um, the. It's not going to have nearly the impact that it might have if you thought about both. If you have a vision. But you also have a, you know, you're you're receptive to your audience. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, because um, I kind of uh, uh, thinking about like you know the the purpose of of uh, our podcast today, and I um, I thought of you because your experience uh, and you are well known the, the world of um, you know um, the the branding. You know, it's uh, the uh, almost like you know you you connect the talent and the vision together. Indeed. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, branding, really branding is just storytelling. You know, it's like, it's about, it's like a good, a good story really, you know, um, offers someone transformation. They, they, they come out being like, being someone different than they were when they went into it. You know, mm-hmm. like you, you've learned something new, you've, you expanded yourself a bit. And so a good mm-hmm. brand can also offer you kind of that kind of thing. It's a, it's a good story that's consistent. It's authentic. It's, it's, um, you know, considered, um, you know, in, in, in more, more often than not, it's very nuanced and focused to, again, that their, their audience. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of thinking about like the audience of, of our podcast uh, today. You are bringing the value to the world mm-hmm. right now for for the audience that um, let's say that they are just starting out mm-hmm. or uh, they are like you know have this idea mm-hmm. uh, and um, but they don't know uh, how to go from there mm-hmm. or like how to uh, connect that uh, vision together. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't even know what brand is right you know right yeah what would i what would i tell them you're wondering like yeah like i kind of kind of think that they are just starting something and and don't they don't know how to connect the talent and vision together like yeah like what advice would you give right i think i mean i could use you you as an example um but i think that you when you started your brand it felt very authentic i mean it, it was authentic it was it was mm-hmm. literally named after you you know <laughs> uh, uh Mangai. it was very straightforward and and mm-hmm. what was so brilliant about your branding in my opinion was everything everything that you could you know see as a customer was basically hand done like your hand done menu was so charming mm-hmm. and like your mm-hmm. handwriting was better than any font that I could mm-hmm. ever pick as a designer you know mm-hmm. and and I feel like and you chose that because it was cheap and you could just do it and it yeah. was easy and it, you don't yeah. have to tell anyone how to design it or do anything and so but but that is the mark of authenticity again you made mm-hmm. choices that made sense for your brand and what you focused on was making the best food you possibly could and being mm-hmm. a wonderful person to talk to whenever I'm waiting for my food you were mm-hmm. such a pleasure and we we became quick friends because I would go get your delicious food like you know, multiple times a week um, from Ace Hotel. And, you know, I just feel like branding isn't, it doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. It just needs to be real. You know, branding Mm -hmm. just needs to be, um, again, you, when I said earlier that you had your vision, your vision was Mm -hmm. you knew how to cook, your specific, you know, mm-hmm. like culinary vision. I didn't of, have uh, a vision. Right. Well, I, I, I think I have like um like a blur vision. Sure. <laughs> but you knew how to make Kao Mangai and, you, uh, knew, yes, and you knew how to make it really well yeah. and really simply. And you mm-hmm. knew that you could, you know, turn that around. And so you didn't need anything more than that besides being, like I said, being authentic, being charming and, uh, you know, offering it at a good price. And mm-hmm. I think also just like the paper, like the fact that you put your rice and chicken and sauce in, in paper and wrapped it in, in um, a rubber band and handed it to somebody mm-hmm. was such a, beautiful simple way to take your lunch because Mm -hmm. it was not only the pack to go packaging but it was also the plate Mm -hmm. and then it was just so little waste and it Mm -hmm. just everything about it was so charming and I I remember being really excited about how simple and how perfect it was and um, I feel like like I said branding doesn't have to be complicated Mm -hmm. I think it can be very simple and I think you don't need much of a vision you just need enough you need to know like can I offer something that somebody will actually pay for? Because price mm-hmm. and value are just simply different things. You brought up value a couple mm-hmm. times, and I think mm-hmm. price, um, mm-hmm. you know, is completely arbitrary. You know, like mm-hmm. value is what someone will pay for something. Mm-hmm. Like, what is something worth? I don't. That's that really depends on the person. Mm-hmm. You know, it depends. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, but price um, really, I think, is um, price follow, follow, follows value, not the other way around. Yes. Value doesn't follow price. Mm. People think it's the other way around. People think that you pay more money to get a luxury item, and you do. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily better. Like a Rolls, mm-hmm. when you think about a Rolls Royce or a Toyota, mm-hmm. which is a more reliable car, 
mm-hmm. which is a which is a better car. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I would gamble Toyota because like mm-hmm. they just simply have an incredible, impeccable track record of making really like unstoppable machines. Yeah. Um, but Rolls Royce, it's a luxury car, a mm-hmm. little less reliable, mm-hmm. but you're paying more money. Which one's which one's better? Mm-hmm. Depends yes. on who you're talking to. Yes. Do you think like part of the process uh, of developing brand is you help? them identify their audience first yeah absolutely i mean i think that um ab- basically if you're starting a brand um i'll t- give you one quick tip on on brand strategy everybody um brand <laughs> strategy is basically three simple questions um it's what change am i trying to make who is it for and why do i feel that way and it's kind of that simple Um, you know, it, it's you know I, I attribute a lot of that that simple breakdown to Seth Godin. He's somebody I've followed for a long time. He's really a smart thinker in this realm. I highly recommend you know your listeners check him out if they haven't. He's written several books. He's doing a podcast. He's written, he's literally created schools around this stuff. I mean, he's an incredible force to be reckoned with. And and he's right. I mean, basically, it's like you have to understand what change am I trying to make? Like you know, like the change you were trying to make with Kalman Guy was mm-hmm. you know you're like no one's offering this. I, I need to make a living that's the only change you wanted to make you wanted to like mm-hmm. make a you know like at, at first you know what i mean and then and as your I, vision grew yeah it grew you yeah know? yeah um so you don't have it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be you don't have to change the world right out of the gates but mm-hmm. once you get your footing you can start rethinking like why you're doing what you're doing but the, the second question so you ask yourself what change am i trying to make and then and then who's it for well who's the change for that they've, originally the change was for you you made you made your own brand so you would have a, a way to make a living my my thing was uh, that i i i s t r i p All the option away, and only do have you don't have choice. You only have one choice. And that was so novel at the time. Like I mean, to go somewhere where you don't have to make a choice was yeah, a luxury. 12 years ago. Yeah, exactly. 12 <laughs> years ago, crazy. I mean, honestly, it's like it was so great, and it was such a such a refreshing change. So like to walk from one cart where there's countless choices, and they're all kind of similar, and you're like, I don't know which is the best one. To walk into one cart where you're like, I'll take one, please. Yeah. That phrase. Mm-hmm. I'll take one. Is so. I mean, a, a huge gift you're giving to your audience. You're, I mean, really, you're giving your gift a gift to your audience. So, mm-hmm. I, th- you know, again, the brand strategy stuff is like, what change you're trying to make and who's it for, mm-hmm. and then why. And the last question is to check in with yourself. Why do you feel that way? Mm-hmm. What What are your sources? What are you What are you looking at? What What made you feel this way to begin with? And because mm-hmm. you could be wrong, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. once you dig in, once mm-hmm. you talk to somebody else, you mm-hmm. definitely could. Um, You know, be be off with your measures, mm-hmm. and so and that's useful. It's useful to catch yourself early, and mm-hmm. then you can pivot before you even come out of the gates with something that's a little bit more focused on again that balance between your own vision and what is good for the world. Yes. And 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 you know, if you ask yourself why every step of the way, you really are, you're doing you're doing yourself a, a favor. Have you ever worked with the brand or something that you didn't believe in their product? No, no, like that's just like that was our stipulation um, for the past 11 years. Uh, when my my time with OMF Chico, we mm-hmm. we had a, a really um, strong policy, and a, we were proud of it that mm-hmm. we we didn't take work that we didn't believe in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we that doesn't mean that we didn't take work that was you know some jobs were just for money and some jobs were more for portfolio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's fair game. Yeah, but every job we took on, we believed in to. To some degree, like mm-hmm. we we had to we had to either believe in the people, the product, the service, mm-hmm. and and also like them, you yeah. know, because we're going to be working with them for the next several months. So it's like yeah. if we didn't like them, mm-hmm. I mean that's that's foolish for us, you know, yeah. like because then we're we're making our own lives mm-hmm. hellish. So, um, in in a nutshell, yeah, I, I'd say that, um, yeah, I, I think that. It's a luxury too that you have that option. Yeah, I mean it is. It is yeah. a luxury. Yeah. I, and, oh, that's what I was going to. Thank you for saying that. It is yeah. a luxury for saying that. Um, and sometimes at first you do need to say yes to just about everything. Mm-hmm. And, and I wouldn't put everything in your portfolio at first, but I would say mm-hmm. yes to just about everything. Yeah. But you, as soon as you realize you do have something, mm-hmm. and you want to be associated with only certain things. From that point, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't know, and you're mm-hmm. just like simply, you know, um, needing to make sure that you f- have a busy schedule and you have, you know, people paid and all that kind of stuff, that's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. But if you know what you want to do, like we knew that we wanted to make a positive impact in the world. Mm-hmm. We knew that we only wanted to work with people that we could believe in. Like we yeah. couldn't, we couldn't feel good about like, you know, 
Enron coming to us or, mm -hmm. you know, some, some company that we just didn't believe in um, working for them. And, but, you know, that said, it's like a company mm -hmm. like Walmart, for example, or, mm -hmm. or even like Starbucks, mm -hmm. neither one of them ever came to us. Mm -hmm. But if they did, mm -hmm. they make such a huge impact mm -hmm. um, in, their, in their industries that if we could make an impact on them, we could mm -hmm. make an impact in the world. Yes. And so that would be the only compromise that we would ever make is if we could work with a company like a big corporate c corporation, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, you know, could, could make a positive impact if we could help them, mm -hmm. then we would do that. Yes. But by and large, and we, we have nothing against corporate clients. We had plenty. You know, we worked yeah. with Google, Gap, Land's End, I mean, like all sorts of huge, huge companies. Um, uh, it was more about like, because a big company is not an evil company. Yeah. An evil company does bad things. That's, yeah. that's an evil company. And, <laughs> and that can be big or small, you know? Yeah. And um, so we just tried our, did our best to, do, to align ourselves with brands and s services and people that we could feel good about. Yes. Um, so um, uh, that's like new brand, old brand. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. when uh, you have you ever have to work with uh, old brand, revamp, and then like how how would you approach that? Oh yeah, yeah. A new br building a new brand versus a rebrand is an entirely different beast. Honestly, it's almost it's almost night and day difference. Um, in the sense of like, a good analogy is kind of like building a house. Mm. You know, like if you get an old house that has you know good old bones. Mm -hmm you might be able to like do something cool with it, but it might be more expensive mm -hmm. than if you simply just built from the ground up yes. because you have to work around things mm -hmm. and you don't know what you're going to unearth behind that wall or behind that floor or, you know, you don't know what's there until, mm -hmm. it, until you unearth it, until you, until you come across it. So, mm -hmm. so rebranding is, is mm -hmm. similar in the, in the way that it has lots of pitfalls. Sometimes mm -hmm. people are attached to things that they don't need to be attached to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, there's baggage um, that's hard to overcome simply because it's associated with that company and sometimes mm -hmm. it's best to just simply rename them and, and forget the baggage. And it really, each one is unique. Each yes. one is, is um, a puzzle in and of itself. And that's kind of the fun part is like, yeah. it, it's, it's fun figuring out the puzzle. Um, but I would gamble, I mean, honestly, I would gamble that creating a new brand is easier often than creating a rebrand yeah totally. um, only in the sense of changing perception because mm -hmm. changing perception is truly changing action and in, in behavior in people and changing mm -hmm. perception is truly challenging yes. and so once once something is established um it's just harder to work against that but when you're working with a new brand mm -hmm. you don't have that perception and you don't have yeah. that kind of thing so They both they both had their challenges because one one you're making something out of nothing mm -hmm. and one you're taking something familiar and altering it enough to be new but not so much that it's not mm -hmm. what it used to be. Yes. So that's that that da that mm -hmm. balance that nuance is really tricky. There's still a question about bra branding. I, I thought it is is uh, really interesting in, in your perspective. Yeah. Um, like you know some what what makes uh, some brand uh, great brand. Like what differentiate them because some brand like they last f forever and, and and some brand is you know yeah they not stay. That is a very good question. Yeah, brand brand longevity. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many factors that come into that. Um, that like, you know, like like Nike for example mm -hmm. is. I mean, I'll look at the obvious huge ones. Um, mm. They're 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 around and they're doing great because they've always focused on you know like if you have a body you're an athlete kind of mm. thing you know mm -hmm. what i mean and, and like the very universally understood just do it concept you mm -hmm. know like like it transcends sports and i think that's that's how good brands often do it is they use their medium in a way that transcends the medium and becomes universal mm -hmm. if that makes sense like mm -hmm. where they um you know like you use count mm. to open up a universe uh, and mm -hmm. a whole ecosystem around you know what you can do as, a, mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur and so mm -hmm. here you are doing a podcast from that you know mm -hmm. but you've but you've done many other things leading up to this like chopped and mm -hmm. and all the other mm -hmm. things that have put you on the radar um mm -hmm. and 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 made you famous uh, in, in in for good reason um okay. and and i feel <laughs> that yeah it's it's similar it's it's one of those things that um Yeah, I don't know. I think I think that's that that says it all pretty much. Yes, do you think like at the end it's like you know the, the they had it had to have like 
the core value to back up like that their product has to be good or uh, because I think like right do you think so yeah I mean I think so I mean of course their core value yes core values are critical um, and I never used to think that when we first started our company it mm-hmm. was uh, it was about eight years in that we finally did our own exercise on ourselves even though we've done this for countless other brands and we've mm-hmm. you know done all this stuff we mm-hmm. you know the cobbler's kid has no shoes kind of thing mm-hmm. um, applies to us as well like we never worked on our own brand we never worked on our website we never worked on our own um, you know stuff uh, mm-hmm. outwardly speaking uh, mm-hmm. because we were always focused on branding others not yes. branding ourselves mm-hmm. but once we did focus on our own core values and our own um, internal workings and really f- got those tighter um, it, it changed everything for us it changed mm-hmm. how we hired people it changed yes. how you know we ran our studio it changed how we um, how we said yes to new work um, mm-hmm. so I think that there is something to be said for those internally facing documents that keep people aligned. I think Mm -hmm. that's really, really important, but I wouldn't say that that's necessarily what keeps a brand strong in the world for a long time. I think frequently that comes from a brand being able to use their, their expression, their medium in a way that transcends the medium in the sense that like you've heard of Tony Hawk, right? Mm. Well, you're not a skateboarder. But yeah, yeah, you've I, heard of I him. Know, I like yeah. him. Yeah, and he, he his brand has transcended <laughs> mm-hmm. skateboarding because mm-hmm. he is, has become more than that. Mm-hmm. And I think that good brands become more than their thing, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. His thing mm-hmm. is skateboarding, mm-hmm. but when yes. you think of him, he, he's he's so much more than that, and, yeah. and he's made a huge, much much bigger impact um, than that. So, and that's just one example, you know. Yeah. And I use skateboarding because yeah, I grew up skateboarding, but yes. but there's countless examples out yeah. there of of people and brands uh, that have used their expression of their brand to speak a universal truth. And I think that mm-hmm. when you can when you can help others grow and expand and and through universal truths things that ultimately help all of us yes um i think that that simply like puts a stake in the ground for your company to stick around that Mm -hmm. much longer i mean you you remain relevant so start out as the uh, creative kid and you are uh, a successful entrepreneur Uh, how long do you have a moment when you kind of realize not now I, I need to be more than just the creative kid? Do you- oh, yeah. I mean, one of the first times I felt that was when Fritz told me that he and his wife, Victoria, were pregnant. Mm. When, and then we had just started the company about uh-huh. um, six months before. Oh, and, yes. uh, and I was like, dude, we already have a kid. We have a company. Like, yes. that's our kid. I was like, what are you yeah. doing? But yes, he yes. just got married and that's yeah. what married. You know, he's not, he wasn't wrong. And Enzo's yes. a wonderful, wonderful kid. And, and they were, they got excited about it. And, and, and honestly, it made us work harder. I mean, mm-hmm. it really did. It, it focused Fritz, it focused me. And we both realized like we, we can't mess around anymore. Like we, like mm-hmm. we, we've only been doing this for a little while anyway, but like yeah. we definitely weren't making money at first. I covered the salary of, you know him and, and we had a, a third um a partner for a little while uh, our friend matthew mm-hmm. um, hi matthew <laughs> and uh, so i covered both of their salaries at one point out of my own bank account and i was not rich at all and so um it was one of those things where um we were internet famous really fast mm-hmm. because he has stump town in his background and i had a hotel in my background oh. um but we were broke we were mm-hmm. we were like interviewed on cool hunting and and all this stuff and then and mm-hmm. absolutely broke but um mm-hmm. but uh you know it, it's I think that when you get the responsibility of others, uh, when you when you know that your decisions are impacting others directly, mm-hmm. um, and that can come in the form of employees mm-hmm. as well, yes. um, and it and that became very real too. Like as soon as we got our first employees, that kind of changed everything too. Mm-hmm. But you know, having a kid or some sort of thing that simply won't let you um, rest. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. like the, you you know that you have to. Um, show up you know you have to make ends meet that's um, yeah employees will do it and kids will do it I'm not sure what else would do it uh, necessarily for people but those are big ones <laughs> I have a similar uh, experience like my uh, uh, I, I got married uh, when I just like opened the restaurant and and I remember my team were like oh don't don't have kids <laughs> like don't have kids right yet. right <laughs> It's like, I was like, okay, right. you don't get to have a life. Right. It's not fair. Yeah. yeah. And you totally can have a kid and, and, and you totally, and people should, people should do what they want is the point. And they should um, realize that you, you 
kind of can have it all. Like, and, and if you just have to believe it, you, you mm-hmm. can't get to having it all from not believing you can have it all, period. So I, I always feel like the creative side of brain and the, the like um, business yeah. side mm-hmm. is just a two, two different thing, you know, and then um, um, I, I think like part of the uh, not in what we create it creative side is like making decision and I think like that's kind of main part of the job mm. as, as entrepreneur can you tell us about like uh, the, the journey of uh, the making decision under uncertainty circumstance uh, that that it build the 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 fundamental like build your muscle of like you you feel that I I made better decision than before. Well, I think that I think I full, first off I fully agree with you. I think mm-hmm. that um, you know it's been said, and I didn't say this, but it's been mm-hmm. said that you know it's it's common that like liberals will start companies and conservatives will run companies. Mm-hmm. And I didn't I did never heard that until just like recently. Um, but I was like that makes a ton of sense actually mm-hmm. um, because when you're when you're you know a young hungry potential entrepreneur mm-hmm. you know you're not necessarily thinking about the books you're not necessarily thinking about like it penciling like mm-hmm. everything making financial sense it needs to mm-hmm. it, you know you 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 hope it's there mm-hmm. but i think that you're starting from this place of like wouldn't it be cool if wouldn't it be amazing if mm-hmm. you know like that's where you're starting from you're mm-hmm. starting from this place of like we should start a company or we should do it we should whatever mm-hmm. and i feel like that energy is infectious and it's not wrong at all but it's not necessarily long-term thinking it's mm-hmm. like it's more like you know like when we started the company we did not begin with the end in mind but yet that became one of our core tenants of mm-hmm. you know we always begin a project with the end in mind and so it's good for entrepreneurs to ask themselves where do we want to go with this thing like where do we see ourselves in 10 years like say we do start this mm-hmm. company mm-hmm. where do we see ourselves in 10 years what's our exit strategy do we want to retire off of this do we mm-hmm. want to just like um do we want to do this for a little while and then pivot do we want to like you know like that kind of stuff these are mm-hmm. these are really um unfun boring questions to ask yourself at the beginning of a, you know a, any venture that are so important like they're so worth your time because it's just it's Life is just a weird thing and you just don't know. And so these thinking of it from that perspective of, of trying to integrate both sides of the brain early mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. starting with what you have, mm-hmm. which, you know, like I said, most, not all, but most people that are starting businesses are, are these excited kind of dreamers, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and frequently CEOs that are brought in or frequently are these like dudes with or women with economic backgrounds and they're, you know, like that have like clear, um, you know, like, more conservative tendencies like you know that are, that are really good with money and th- that kind of thing and so i think as a business owner i found myself learning to be more like fiscally conservative and i never was before mm-hmm. and i learned certain things um about um you know w- long-term thinking i mm-hmm. think that wasn't always there in, uh, for me it was more like i was more happy with you know, solving this project and then, and then thinking about like, what's maybe our next project. But, mm-hmm. but then we brought in our third partner, um, Evan, uh, a few years back and he really helped stabilize us. And he was that like Fritz and I were those liberals that started the company and he was that conservative that came in and really helped kind of n- add like a balance to, you know, um, all of our processes, all of our systems, you know, he helped us put documents into place. He helped us, you know, really just make sense of things. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think I learned by being around someone that was actually naturally good at it. And he mm-hmm. learned, you know, Evan, I, I can't speak for him, but I think that he loved being around the creative energy of the studio. He's still, he's still there. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he loves it. And I, he, he had left a, you know, a background of being a financial analyst and dealing mm-hmm. with video games and, and all sorts of like, it was kind of a, kind of a bro-y culture. And, mm-hmm. and as much as that was fine and fun and he had his good times or whatever, I think he was like done with it. Mm-hmm. And I think he was really, really happy to come to a place that was so, um, yeah creative and fun and loose and open and and so i think that you know we offered each other something you know Mm -hmm. he was he happened to be one of fritz's old college buddies and that worked out perfect for everybody and Mm -hmm. and evan was somebody that he that fritz and i would go to for advice for like um you know how to run the company or how to make this decision or Mm -hmm. whatever he's he's just like one of the most um business-minded people we had known Mm -hmm. um and so whenever time time came for you know an opportunity to partner together like mm-hmm. we were like yes absolutely it was mm-hmm. it was incredible that he he 
was willing to I mean honestly he took a massive pay cut I mean it's mm-hmm. like I don't even know how I literally don't even know how much and I don't want to know mm-hmm. but it's just like we paid him probably one tenth of what he used to make you know yes. what I mean mm-hmm. um, as a partner you yeah. know what I mean um, and uh, you know and that's it's because it's people he told me this like this is a sign of a good C- CFO mm-hmm. he's like people work places for lots of reasons and mm-hmm. money is just one of them mm-hmm. yes and so he wasn't doing it for the money you mm-hmm. know and a lot of mm-hmm. people like there starts to be a point where like i think money is one of those things where if you can make enough mm-hmm. to stop thinking about it mm-hmm. then you can focus on what matters mm-hmm. and like that's my goal with money and that's my mm-hmm. and that's what i try to encourage others to think about is like get away from subsistence living and don't think about like making the most money in the world mm-hmm. just make enough just figure out what you need mm-hmm. and make enough that you're good and, yes. if, and if something goes wrong you still have like a little cushion mm-hmm. you know like but t- like to to focus exclusively on money is to, is to be a little short-sighted i think um mm-hmm. because it really is just a means to an end and, and there's no end that's the trick yeah um you know like that mm-hmm. that's that's the funny part Um, in the talk, like we, you mentioned um, exit strategy, mm-hmm. and, and you, uh, w- would you like to talk about that at all? Oh yeah, yeah. Exit mm-hmm. strategies are, are interesting because they don't they have, they're not so they're not the bleak thing that they might sound like. Um, they're actually like a really positive, empowered way of looking at how do we grow this company because when, when for example, when you grow something in a garden, the end game is that you're going to eat that thing that you grew. It's not going to just grow in the ground forever. You're mm-hmm. not going to just plant things forever. You're going to go through the cycle, and you're going to go through each step along the way. And so, your end goal, you know, if all things work out well, is you have this delicious eggplant, or you have this thing when you're all done, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of similar. Um, like one of the things I'm most grateful for, you know, in in uh, Evan's arrival to OMFG Co. when we, when I was there. Um, was that he helped us put documents into place that we didn't necessarily have before mm-hmm. like things about like you know if if there was a buyout which I went through mm-hmm. um, if there's a buyout this is how it goes mm-hmm. like and and so we we wrote those together when things were positive you mm-hmm. know what I mean when things yes. were good and and we we're clear and we're protecting all parties we're protecting the company we're protecting the, the mm-hmm. people involved and we're mm-hmm. thinking about it from all angles so when push comes to shove because you know buyouts aren't always pleasant and, mm-hmm. and frequently they're not you know and mm-hmm. luckily luckily ours was you know luckily mm-hmm. you know i left amicably and and i'm still um friends with with both evan and fritz to this day and and um i feel really really grateful for that and i really attribute a lot of that to the fact that we had the paperwork in place mm-hmm. you know and, and that that protected us it, it was from uh Evan's idea because he kind of uh maybe have experience of see the big picture so mm-hmm. it was kind of plan ahead yes 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 yeah. yeah and so it's like definitely i recommend um whether or not it's it translates as paperwork or documents or whether it translates as just a conversation or whether it translates as um as as question marks and then nothing's final it's just simply good to ask yourself and ask your partners who you're working with What is what is your end goal here? What is your exit strategy? Because everyone has one. Everyone, mm-hmm. and and it's fine if they're different. They don't need to be the same. Mm-hmm. Like when we started the company, no one had children, you know. Mm-hmm. And then Fritz had a had a child, and, mm-hmm. and now has a family, and and has different needs and responsibilities than I have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so th- it's fair for his end game to be different than my end game. Mm-hmm. It's totally legit. The same mm-hmm. with Evan, you know. Like he's yeah. got an entirely different background and entirely different focus. And so, you know, I think we're. People, I think, I think mistakenly feel that they need to agree on everything, and I don't think you need to. I think you just need to be direct and and honest with what you're thinking and feeling and why with mm-hmm. your partners. And and if you can talk o- honestly and openly, then you have you have good partners. So, um, talking about owning a company and uh, your staff uh, is the uh, creative staff. Uh, they are known for um, uh, hard to manage. Mm. Yeah, uh, it depends. I mean, challenging. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that running a company and managing a company are different things, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Because it's like you. I mean, in this is more obvious at scale. Like there are people mm-hmm. that own companies that are not the CEO, and the CEO runs the company, and then the person mm-hmm. that owns it just gets rich, right? Um, mm-hmm. But in smaller versions, it's not as easy to to decipher that. But you know, ultimately, managing is. Managing has never been my strong suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, managing other people, and um, I think that 
it's a sad truth that small businesses, small business owners frequently start off doing what they're best at, which is like, say, hey, making cow or mm-hmm. making or doing branding mm-hmm. or um, whatever. And then as you grow and as you get employees, mm-hmm. who's making the cow now? Yeah. Not you. Mm-hmm. And who's doing yes. the branding now? Not me. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, other people are. You know, and I'm, yes. I'm doing my best to like essentially manage them. When mm-hmm. whatever, that's not my skill set. That's like, that's a learned skill that I'm learning now. Still, mm-hmm. um, at, at not being a business owner, but while mm-hmm. I was a business owner, I was actively, mm-hmm. actively reading. You know, tons of books, reading. You know, listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks about mm-hmm. leadership and about all these things. And, and mm-hmm. managing, managing and leading are very different. Is what I've learned. Um, mm-hmm. But in general, I'd say managing is one of the hardest parts of a of running a company. Um, and I'm, but but I only say that because it's not my skill set. For someone else, it's like one of the easiest parts, you know. And so you yeah. hire that person, mm-hmm. you know, yes. and and you put them into place and you let them do your thing and get out of their way. Yeah, and the the hard part is the when you started it, uh, uh, you didn't think that you have to manage someone. That it's a totally different skill set. Hundred percent. Yes, and. And the the other part I, I like when when you talk about the exit strategy, is because it's it's uh, I think when we start out we just create 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 you know we put all the energy into that and we we not foreseen that. Absolutely. Well, and you also no one wants to think about the bad times mm-hmm. no one wants to you yeah know? but but the bad times are literally inevitable you know like mm-hmm. in, in one so we used to make a joke because evan had a few sayings that he would say often and he was like we'd say pull the string as if you're pulling a string on a doll that's going to say the thing and, mm-hmm. but one of his things that he would frequently say is these are the good times mm-hmm. these are the good times he's yes. like because it's like you know remember the good old days is a common phrase that people mm-hmm. will say like ah oh, remember that you know early days that was mm-hmm. so simple then mm-hmm. well Basically, it serves you well mm-hmm. to be mindful that when things are good, to mm-hmm. appreciate them. Yes, you know, and mm-hmm. because they will mm-hmm. not be good eventually. Like he yeah. used to say, these are the good times long yeah. before the pandemic. And when the pandemic yeah. hit, he stopped saying it. He's like, yeah. these are not the good times. You know, yes. Like, yes. and 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 he was right. I mean, and so it it's nice because it allows you to celebrate the little stuff. Yes. You know, it yeah. allows you to like kind of be grateful in the in the more of the present moment and and mm-hmm. recognize that these are the good times and this is pretty amazing that we what we have here. You know, like yeah. working with each other and doing mm-hmm. these things. And I and I honestly I tried to talk openly about that how lucky I felt often um, mm-hmm. during my time with with Fritz and Evan and the crew at OMF Co. It was like one of those things where I I feel like yeah like I I never lost sight of how lucky I felt and and um, we we did some amazing work together. And so I feel really lucky for that. What, what do you think was the, what's the uh, formula of the success of, uh, of, of OMF Chico? Oh, I don't know. It's still going. It's still successful. I think I, it's hard to say. I think it was partially timing. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was part, I mean, it, I would say it's different, but similar to your success, to be honest, mm-hmm. because You were in Portland doing something interesting at the right time in the mm-hmm. right place. You were blocks yeah. away from Ace Hotel. Ace yeah. Hotel became this epicenter hub of mm-hmm. you know creative uh, expression for a lot of people. And and at that time in Portland, you know, 10, 12 years ago, mm-hmm. it felt there was an energy. I think you can attest to this. There was mm-hmm. an energy in the city that felt really palpable. It was mm-hmm. very real, and it was it. it And every it felt like everybody I knew was doing something interesting, and mm-hmm. so it wasn't just us doing something interesting. It, what we weren't mm-hmm. shaping Portland; we were part of multiple people, you yourself included, yes. um, all doing their thing to make Portland the special place that it was. Yes, and I felt so jazzed by that whole thing. I felt so not only part of a community, but part of something bigger than a community. Part mm-hmm. of something that we were Portland was influencing Japan. Mm-hmm. Portland was. Um, you know, like definitely getting on the national radar. It was definitely like starting to like be this thing where it became a parody of itself. Obviously, P- mm-hmm. Portlandia with the show. Mm-hmm. And but before all that, like I was just incredibly proud of the city um, that I felt like I had a hand in shaping, and and that mm-hmm. you had a hand in shaping, and our friends mm-hmm. had a hand in shaping. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and it, s- sadly, it doesn't feel like that right now. But uh, but maybe maybe in a few years it'll it'll pick back up again. But um, but it was it was definitely. I think the part of the secret to our success is that Fritz 
is just an incredibly charming guy, mm -hmm. has a ton of friends, um, was, he, he had a history of working at Wyden and Kennedy. I had a brief stint there myself. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of relationships. Mm -hmm. We knew a lot of the people, a lot of the chefs that were doing stuff, like yourself included. Mm -hmm. We knew a lot of the artists that were doing things. We knew a lot of, you know, built developers and builders that were that were developing buildings. So I felt like we happened to know the right people. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of them were doing interesting things at the same time. And I feel like we grew with that. And so mm -hmm. and then and then we've um been lucky to maintain a, a, a true um unique uh voice on the in the portland branding scene um mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. this whole time and and i i think that just simply comes from just being alive i think that fritz and i had just had our voices as co-creative directors and, and co-founders of the of the studio that we imbued into the studio mm -hmm. and i think that that just is our thumbprint i think it's hard to mm -hmm. escape it and i and mm -hmm. i think that um you know, like if I was to partner with someone else, it would be a different thumbprint. And if I, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like yeah. if he was to partner with someone else, it'd be a different thumbprint still. So mm -hmm. I think we, we kind of, it was partially luck of time, partially, you know, our, our chemistry together because we really complemented each other too. Mm -hmm. We have, we like when you find someone that you click with and that you can work with well, like hold on to that person because you can't work with, well with everybody. And, yeah. and so Fritz and I knew how to argue well together. We mm -hmm. knew how to, you know, push on each other's ideas. We knew we mm -hmm. weren't precious about our own files. Like I would share with him my files and he'd open them and mess with them for a while and then I'd open mm -hmm. his and we'd show each other what we've done. Mm -hmm. And like we got somewhere different each time and that was cool. Mm -hmm. yes. and, we, and, we, and we were good sounding boards for each other as far as like, you know gut checks you know like mm -hmm. if you're if you're designing in a vacuum by yourself you know, you have three designs in front of you and you don't you're like ah they're all kind of cool it's helpful for someone else to come in and be like that one's the best one those are okay but that's the strongest and this is why I just tweak mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. it's you know like we were good for for each other like that yes and uh and you know like that's definitely i think what's um i think still coming through in mm -hmm. the dna of omf Chico, regardless of of my presence or anything else i think that the the, the team that they have and everything that they're doing is is incredible so um, when COVID hit, um, what happened, and um, it, um, is there uh, something that you you comfortable sharing? Of course, yeah. Yes. Um, I feel honestly the COVID thing was so so interesting for us to navigate because about a year prior, um, uh, we got really interested. Fritz, Evan, and myself mm -hmm. um, got really interested in the idea of building more autonomy for our studio. Um, mm -hmm. more you know like building teams so we, mm -hmm. we instead of having you know 20 employees we had three teams of mm -hmm. you know four or five people each mm -hmm. and then we had an admin team as well mm -hmm. and you know that really helped people um gel together they, mm -hmm. they, they work together consistently they they start mm -hmm. to getting more efficient together they start you know jiving together and, and having their own voice and so mm -hmm. they can they you know we would assign a client to a team and mm -hmm. they would stay together the whole time and mm -hmm. it was just like beautiful mm -hmm. and then we started talking about um remote work and mm -hmm. now remote work is commonplace everybody else everyone's <laughs> using zoom everyone's doing the thing mm -hmm. but we were like this is going to be liberation for us mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. fritz and i years ago mm -hmm. when it was just like four of us it was mm -hmm. fritz and myself and a couple of other mm -hmm. employees we worked it out so we had like a four-day work week mm -hmm. um and we worked it out so we would basically very easily split our time in the morning and the afternoon like this is mm -hmm. our morning priorities these are our afternoon priorities mm -hmm. monday through thursday mm -hmm. friday is our day if we got if we are behind if mm -hmm. we didn't get our stuff done mm -hmm. we'll stay and work but if we're done we're done mm -hmm. and because i was like we don't we don't even need to tell our clients and, mm -hmm. and no no clients were disappointed no no work was um you know uh like phoned in everything mm -hmm. was done really well mm -hmm. and, and we did this for about a year Mm -hmm. We had a four day work week and that changed everything for us. We were like, wow, we feel like we're so much more balanced. Like we can go mm -hmm. to the go to the dentist and go to the bank and like mm -hmm. not not have to like um rush on the weekend to, and fill everything up. Mm -hmm. And so because we had this taste of freedom, we knew we wanted to offer that to our whole staff, you know, and, and we were like, We don't know if we can just do a four day work week, but we can do remote work mm -hmm. because remote work allows you mm -hmm. to be flexible and people mm -hmm. can just kind of be adults and, and mm -hmm. be accountable. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked to a few studios in town and uh, Parliament in particular, uh, Chris and, and all those guys over there were really helpful and really um, transparent with like what they did mm -hmm. to, to go remote. And um, they used Slack as a central tool for communication. Mm -hmm. They used mm -hmm. all these things. And so we mimicked almost one-to-one -one what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it worked great. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're in the studio. Tuesday, Thursday, we're remote. Mm -hmm. So we did that for most of... 
2019. Mm -hmm. And so when the pandemic hit in mm. March, mm -hmm. I mean, I literally had just arrived back from a vacation mm -hmm. on February 29th or 28th or something like that. It was like leap year. So it was like one of mm -hmm. those last days in February. Mm -hmm. And my partner, Evan, at the time calls me on the weekend and he's like, hey, so the pandemic kind of got worse while you were gone. <laughs> um, we're gonna. Uh, Where were you? Yeah. Uh, well, Anna and I went to uh, Sayulita, Mexico. Oh yeah. It was yes. a beautiful, yes. really, really lovely place. I recommend it. Um, yeah. But yeah, we were there for just like you know ten days, and, and it was we weren't thinking much of it. We were just like on a winter vacation in a in a warm climate, and uh, we came back and you know we had to wear you know matt we were like some of the first people wearing masks in the country um i'd say <laughs> regarding covid and we were wearing masks on the flight home and all this stuff and he's like yeah so covid's gotten worse i, th I think people i think things are going to lock down he's like um he's like honestly it's like if you guys are comfortable with it i think we should i should i think we should go remote um you know like as of next week mm -hmm. like why not and and so we went remote a full week before the rest of oregon went remote um because yeah. we could because yes. why not we're already remote um and then we just went full remote basically so and then when that happened i mean our big goal that fritz and evan and i talked about was not losing anybody like that was mm -hmm. the big, biggest fear we had as employers was like mm -hmm. you know we just we couldn't predict anything at that point and and we were going to just do our best to did you lose clients we lost time? we what we lo we didn't lose clients we just lost interest mm -hmm, people people mm -hmm. were literally like we were talking with people more than one client about projects uh -huh. and then all of a sudden they just were like this project is now on hold mm -hmm. we didn't lose them yes but we didn't get their money either and we, didn't mm -hmm. get, we couldn't move forward yeah so it was they and they um it was just everything was on hold all of a sudden mm -hmm. and so it was tricky um and we we definitely like did everything we could to like we have a lot of plants at our studio so like mm -hmm. i would go once a week to the studio and water the plants and mm -hmm. did our, our best to like you know figure out a new a new system in this this pandemic like in mm -hmm. the heart of the pandemic world not now yeah. but like at the very very beginning and when things were still scary and people were really freaked out um i'm personally not so scared anymore and i'm also not freaked out um but uh it was like one of those things where we yeah we just no one knew anything and we were just doing all of us were doing our best and our our number one goal was to not lose anyone and i think that the only person that's left um besides myself in this pandemic was offered a better job offer so she mm -hmm. she left because she like i think was becoming a partner of a startup or something which is really mm -hmm. cool um i was gone so i don't know the details but um but everyone else is still there and then that's remarkable you know like mm -hmm. th through everything um it's uh you know a, a testament to fritz and evans um you know leadership and and um the choices that they made throughout the year so how, how long have you uh been in this uh location the cabin um i i got the cabin um the same week that we finalized the buyout believe it or not um mm -hmm. or, or, or offici officiated not finalized officiated the buyout uh uh in january or in june of 2020 so yes. all in one week's time my mm -hmm. whole life changed you know yes. i, I yeah. bought this place in march of last year like this time a year ago yeah um but i didn't when i bought it i did not plan on not being a part of the company mm -hmm. i planned on on um working from here remotely yes and traveling to the city as i needed to and yeah. so it it's uh it's funny that um things panned out the way they did and i and i can't say that it, um that it would have been my choice i think i probably would have stuck around with omf Gico forever because it's mm -hmm. you know like it's, i co-founded it you mm -hmm. know um so on some level i'm i'm a little i'm i have to admit that i'm grateful that i was forced into this because this experience out here has been mm -hmm. incredible I, mm -hmm. i feel like i've been gifted this incredible um window of time mm -hmm. to think and to heal and to grow mm -hmm. and um and i and i'm taking every opportunity to do those things like i'm mm -hmm. focusing very much on quote unquote building my house and, yes. and like to me that's like working on myself working mm -hmm. on my, literally working on my place yes and um kind of getting back to center of of who i am without my company because i think as a business owner you might relate to this mm -hmm. especially with your name on your business mm -hmm. i want to change yeah it. right i bet <laughs> well so the thing is like you you in you, as a business owner you can't help but be proud when your business succeeds and mm -hmm. and you know like like really 
push for it. And so when, mm-hmm. when OMF GECO grew and mm-hmm. grew to the point that it did and got and had the momentum it did, it was mm-hmm. not only mm-hmm. it was not only a company that I was proud of, but it was mm-hmm. like it was an extension of me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And and I say this a, a little sheepishly because it's like it's so clearly ego driven and like mm-hmm. and, and we all have it. We all have mm-hmm. ego. Mm-hmm. But it's like but I don't want to feed my ego like mm-hmm. i don't think it helps me i think that um i think it's better for me it's like this challenge of mm-hmm. being of, mm-hmm. of going through a buyout and not mm-hmm. having my creative center mm-hmm. not having um my creative community is forcing me to understand who what i bring to the table just me yes. by myself yes and um and i think it's really it's it's been very good for me and i think it's probably good for everybody to to be challenged mm-hmm. like that at some point in their lives yes um do you think like you know because like when when we're at work uh, let's say like we just accomplished this project today you know it's it's measurable and like you know we get like dopamine mm-hmm. you know and 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 it's 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 like a super boost and and you feel good mm-hmm. you know and then now that you are living the life of your your dream uh, and it could be something that you dream of before and and you think like oh maybe when i'm not busy i'm gonna have this life mm-hmm. and and but but we we so addicted to that dopamine absolutely i mean yeah. honestly i do miss it i miss i miss mm-hmm. um the Kiosk. yeah I, i loved i mean i loved who i worked with like not mm-hmm. only my employees but my crew my my clients like mm-hmm. like they're friends literally yeah. like all of us were you know we actually liked each other you yeah. know and still like each other you know, yeah. I mean, in, 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 in many ways but I just don't see them anymore um, mm-hmm. the way I used to and I don't have the community I used to have but none of mm-hmm. us really do I guess yes. we, we the, the pandemic changed that for all of us so boohoo mm-hmm. me but boohoo all of us really <laughs> um, and um, I do miss it I mean it's like one of those things where I, it's it's also really nice to feel needed mm-hmm. like I felt my schedule was ridiculous before mm-hmm. I mean mm-hmm. my schedule was laughable i mean mm-hmm. more like we had three producers one for each team and, and each one of them was just like i'm trying to schedule something for you but this is impossible like it mm-hmm. was it, it was impossible and, and I, i don't know how that would have changed if mm-hmm. i didn't yes. leave you know and yeah. honestly like i don't think it would have changed i think it would i would have stayed just as busy and so it's uh yeah it's interesting it's interesting um being on the other side of, of everything and being able to feel such gratitude for this because it's again something i as a business owner you don't necessarily ask for a buyout from something that you started and that you're still really really into you know mm-hmm. like i felt like i felt like i was like impacting people's lives positively through the mm-hmm. work we're doing at on fgco it's mm-hmm. like again like you said you know brands that last forever like mm-hmm. my answer was mm-hmm. brands that use their medium to transcend just their medium to become more universal i feel like mm-hmm. we used branding mm-hmm. to make a global impact on some level you know mm-hmm. to, to to show people that it can be positive that things can be mm-hmm. um supportive and empowered and and they don't need to be uh, you know necessarily all about consumers or sales or the race to the bottom or mm-hmm. the cheapest i think like um it w- it will be like epi- that one episode of podcast <laughs> of like you know this your new chapter and and what you learn and 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 looks like you are Um, redefine you know your life this, this new chapter absolutely and um, and um, uh, what is your uh, current uh, inspiration it's a good question current inspiration definitely is working on the house I mean living in this beautiful forest I mean I essentially live in the Mount Hood National Forest more or less I li- it's technically the edge of it um, mm-hmm. so it's not really in the forest it's like our acre is butted up against the the forest right behind us um, and so being out here is just so inspirational by itself um, just uh, waking up out here working out here working on the house um, like that's huge but I think another another big inspiration point for me right now is um just learning like i feel like i'm in school again Mm -hmm. even though even though my schedule is the most lax it's been in a long time Mm -hmm. i feel like i'm literally constantly listening to something or reading something that's growing my brain that's Mm -hmm. like making me smarter making me understand something differently and i mean i don't know if if you feel the same way but 2020 like changed my perspective on a lot of things i Mm -hmm. mean it's nuts um Mm -hmm. honestly what my eyes became open to 
um, because I didn't feel necessarily asleep before, um, but clearly I was mm -hmm. in certain ways. Um, so yeah, so other inspiration points would be like, you know, like I'm really fascinated with the art of persuasion right now because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it stems from branding. Um, I mm -hmm. definitely dabbled in that stuff uh, while we were, um, while I was at, at my old studio, but I, mm -hmm. I never truthfully studied it the way I'm studying it now. I never knew the techniques. I never, um, yeah, I guess I just hadn't done the hard work of actually like learning the nitty gritty of persuasion and really mm -hmm. training my brain to understand mm -hmm. it in a new way because we're being persuaded all the time. And it's funny to me how many people think that their ideas about things are their own ideas. Mm -hmm. because often they're not our own ideas so often mm -hmm. they're given to us and we don't know it mm -hmm. you know like and mm -hmm. that's that's the idea of having a trained brain is mm -hmm. if you at least know mm -hmm. you're being given an idea and at least know that that's not necessarily starting from you mm -hmm. um then you're armed with as much wisdom and knowledge as anybody can be to make mm -hmm. a good decision for yourself mm -hmm. um but if you don't know you're being manipulated if you don't know you're being persuaded which most most of us are in that camp Mm. Um, with all things, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. all things, and, and I'm I'm not talking m like just bad things here. I'm talking about good things too. Like, yeah. like yeah. when when people are are excited about something, that's more persuasive than when they're when they're depressed about something. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. that's persuasion. I mean, like that that's one of you know, countless techniques. Repetition mm -hmm. is persuasion. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all sorts of things. And um, so, I just feel like the more we equip ourselves as individuals to be sovereign beings to truly be able to think about the world around us in a way that feels actually informed and balanced and not emotionally knee-jerk responses because mm -hmm. i think that a lot i mean we we like to think we're logical creatures as humans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we're really emotional creatures that yes. logistify things right after yes yes and are. so yeah. that's what's happening over and over myself included i put mm -hmm. myself squarely in the same category mm -hmm. i just feel like i'm just all of a sudden going like wow this became really obvious like it's that about seems, how we feel yes it's about <laughs> how we feel and and I, and I want to feel better and i want to persuade others to to know that they can feel better you yeah. know like i want to use persuasion for for all of its um beneficial properties mm -hmm. for myself and for others and yes. i mean it's it can be argued lots of dire directions that persuasion in and of itself um is a manipulation so like aren't you being tricked by by mm -hmm. listening to persuasion it's like well mm -hmm. I don't know what other choice we have, you know, mm -hmm. like, really, mm -hmm. it's like your only other choice is to go like, la, 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 just cover your ears and not pay attention and, and just be, be fed stuff. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's not, not useful. I think it, we're, we're, we're better equipped to be um, trained to yeah. understand what we're receiving. I love it. I love uh, the conversation. I hope uh, this conversation and we persuade um, <laughs> uh, people to uh, go after their dream. Me too. And take a chance. Uh, and I hope uh, that we adding value uh, to the audience to ride a tiger. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you have to ride the tiger. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jeremy, for uh, having us and led us in uh, this uh, beautiful space and your personal space and. Uh, Uh, sharing uh, your knowledge and, and uh, experience uh, with us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nong. I appreciate you, you wanting to interview me. I appreciate you coming out here for the for the trip. It's not a short drive, but it's a pretty one. And uh, and yeah, and thanks for the conversation. It's it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Riding Tiger podcast, turning feelings of danger, fear into feelings of confidence and control. Please subscribe to the show now and you will be the first to hear new episodes when Nong will share more inspiring stories of the challenges that have been overcome to break into the American dream. If you can wait until then, follow the show on Instagram for more bonus content and on YouTube at Nong's. And keep listening. We are about to announce something mind-blowing to help entrepreneurs survive and even thrive. The Riding Tiger Conference is coming soon.